sideways movements. The main feature of the proximal end of the ulna is this large curved articular surface. The curve that it forms is called the trochlear notch. It articulates with the trochlea of the humerus. The very proximal end of the ulna is the olecranon. The triceps tendon is attached to it. This projection is the coronoid process. Distal to it, this rough area, the ulna tuberosity, marks the insertion of the brachialis tendon. This small curved surface, the radial notch, is where the head of the radius articulates. This is the head of the radius. This is the neck. The end of the head articulates with the capitulum of the humerus. Its curved side articulates partly with the radial notch of the ulna and partly with the ligament that surrounds it, as we'll see. Just distal to the neck is the radial tuberosity, which is the insertion for the biceps tendon. Now let's look at this unique joint where two quite different things happen. The humerus articulates with the forearm bones to form the elbow joint, and the forearm bones articulate with each other to form the proximal radio ulnar joint. Here's the joint with its loose capsule removed and its ligaments intact. Here's the front of the joint in extension, and here's the back of the joint in flexion. The key structure to understand is this remarkable ligament, which not only holds the radial side of the elbow together, but also holds the rotating head of the radius in place against the ulna. It has two parts. This part is the radial collateral ligament. This part is the annular ligament. We'll take the humerus out of the picture for a minute to get a look at the proximal radio ulnar joint. Here's the trochlear notch of the ulna. Here's the head of the radius, seen end on. The annular ligament, together with the radial notch of the ulna, provides a perfectly fitting socket for the head of the radius to rotate in. Here's the annular ligament with the radial head removed. It's attached to the edges of the radial notch of the ulna. It's shaped like a shallow cup, wider here than here, to fit the radial head, not just round here, but also under here. So the radial head, while it's free to rotate, is otherwise totally trapped. Now let's go back to the intact elbow joint and see how it's held together by its two collateral ligaments. The radial one arises from the lateral epicondyle. The two parts of this complex ligament hold the humerus and the radial head securely together. What we see here isn't the edge of the ligament, it's the cut edge of the tendon of origin of a muscle, the supinator, which arises from the ligament. We'll see this shortly. Here's the ulnar collateral ligament. It arises from the medial epicondyle and fans out in a triangle. It's attached to the ulna all along the medial side of the trochlear notch. To complete our picture of the elbow joint, here it is with its capsule intact. The capsule is thin and baggy in front and also behind to allow a full range of movement. There's also a very flexible sleeve of joint capsule here between the annular ligament and the neck of the radius. The elbow joint is stable. That means it stays together for two reasons, partly because of the strength of the ligaments, which we've seen, and partly because of the shape of the bones. The humerus and the ulna interlock closely and deeply. Their surfaces are curved in two planes, from front to back, and from side to side, one continuous space. By contrast, the two joints that we'll look at next, the distal radio ulnar joint and the wrist joint, are physically separate, even though they're close together. So we'll look at them separately. To understand the distal radio ulnar joint, let's look at the distal ends of the radius and the ulna. The head of the ulna has a rounded articular surface. This part articulates with the radius. This part articulates with a key structure that we'll see shortly, the triangular fibrocartilage. The pointed tip of the ulna 
is called the ulnar styloid. The broad distal end of the radius has two articular surfaces. This large one articulates with the proximal row of carpal bones. This small surface articulates with the ulna. This point is the radial styloid. Here's the distal radio ulnar, the structure that holds it together, the triangular fibrocartilage. It's also known as the articular disc. It's attached to the radius here and to the ulnar styloid here. Joint. To understand them, let's look at the bones. We'll look at them this way up. Eight small carpal bones form the carpus. Distal to the carpus are the metacarpal bones, numbered one, two, three, four, and five. The carpal bones are in two rows, a proximal and a distal. The bones in each row are attached closely to one another. The four bones of the proximal row are the scaphoid, the lunate, the triquetral, and the pisiform, which sits by itself on the triquetral. The scaphoid, the lunate, and part of the triquetral articulate with the distal end of the radius to form the radiocarpal joint. The distal surface of the proximal row forms a deeply concave notch which the bones of the distal row fit into. The bones of the distal row are the trapezium, the trapezoid, the capitate, and the hamate. The capitate and part of the hamate project proximally. The bases of the five metacarpals articulate with the distal row here to form the midcarpal joint. The projecting capitate and hamate fit into the notch in the proximal row. When flexion and extension occur at the wrist, the movement happens partly at the radiocarpal joint and partly at the midcarpal joint. When radial deviation and ulnar deviation occur, the action happens mainly at the radiocarpal joint. Here's the wrist joint, or rather joints, with much of the capsule removed and the two collateral ligaments here and here intact. Here's the radiocarpal joint. Here's the midcarpal joint. The radial collateral ligament goes from the radial styloid to the scaphoid and its neighbor, the trapezium. The ulnar collateral ligament goes from the ulnar styloid to the triquetral and pisiform bones. Here's the wrist joint with the joint capsule intact. The joint capsule is thick and strong all the way round the joint. On the extensor aspect, the capsule forms the broad dorsal radiocarpal ligament. On the flexor aspect, it forms the palmar radiocarpal ligament. Unlike the elbow, which is held together partly by the interlocking shape of the bones, the wrist joint is held together entirely by the strength of its ligaments. The two collateral ligaments hold the bones together in radial abduction and ulnar abduction, and the radiocarpal ligaments hold them together in flexion and extension. The strength of the radiocarpal ligaments also ensures that when the radius rotates, the hand goes with it. Before we move on to look at the muscles, Let's review what we've seen of the bones and joints. On the humerus, here's the medial epicondyle and epicondylar ridge, and the lateral epicondyle and epicondylar ridge. Here's the capitulum and the trochlea. On the proximal ulna, here's the trochlear notch, the olecranon, the coronoid process, the ulnar tuberosity, and the radial notch. On the proximal radius, here's the head, the neck, and the radial tuberosity. Here's the radial collateral ligament, the annular ligament, the ulnar collateral, the trapezium, the trapezoid, the capitate, and the hamate. And here are the metacarpals. At the wrist, 
Here's the triangular fibrocartilage, the radial collateral ligament, the ulnar collateral ligament, the palmar radiocarpal, and dorsal radiocarpal ligaments. Now let's look at the muscles. There are three sets of muscles to look at. The ones that flex and extend the elbow, the ones that pronate and supinate the forearm, and the ones that flex and extend the wrist. We'll look at each set of muscles separately. Later on in this section, we'll see them all together. First, the muscles that flex and extend the elbow. There are three flexors and one extensor. The three flexors are brachialis, biceps, and brachioradialis. Here's the brachialis muscle. It arises from this broad area on the anterior humerus. It's inserted here on the ulnar tuberosity. The action of brachialis is to flex the elbow, which it does equally well whether the forearm is pronated or supinated. The biceps muscle, its full name is biceps brachii, lies in front of the brachialis. It's a more complicated muscle. For a start, it has two heads, a long and a short. To get a good look at them, let's take away the anterior third of the deltoid muscle and also pectoralis major. Here's the shoulder joint to reach its origin from the supraglenoid tubercle of the scapula. The two heads unite to form a single belly, which narrows to form this unusual two-part tendon. The main part dives down between the radius and the ulna and inserts on the radial tuberosity. On its lateral edge, the tendon fans out. Here it is in the intact forearm into a thin sheet of fascia, the bicipital aponeurosis, which becomes continuous with the deep fascia that surrounds the forearm. The aponeurosis gives the biceps an indirect attachment to the ulna. The biceps flexes the elbow. It does this more efficiently when the forearm is pronated because then it's fully stretched when it starts its action. The biceps can also be a powerful supinator of the forearm, as we'll see later. The last of the three elbow flexors is brachioradialis. It arises halfway up the humerus, just below the deltoid tuberosity. It's inserted all the way down here on the distal radius. Brachioradialis is an efficient flexor of the elbow, whether the forearm is pronated or supinated. The action of the flexors is opposed by just one extensor muscle, the triceps. The triceps muscle has three heads, a long head, a lateral head, and a medial or deep head. The long head arises, as we saw in the last section, from the infraglenoid tubercle of the scapula. The lateral head arises high up on the lateral side of the posterior humerus. The medial head arises from a broad area lower down and more medially. As we'll see, the radial nerve runs next to the bone between the lateral and medial heads. The three heads of triceps converge to form this massive tendon, which inserts here on the olecranon. Contraction of the triceps extends the elbow. Just for completeness, we need to mention this tiny muscle, the anconius. It runs from the lateral epicondyle to the lateral aspect of the proximal ulna. Anconius is a very minor elbow extensor. Now let's look at the muscles that produce pronation and supination. There are two of each. Of the two pronator muscles, the larger and more proximal one is pronator teres. Along with several other muscles, it arises from the medial epicondyle. In addition, it has a small deep head of origin, which arises from this part of the ulna. Here's the deep head of pronator teres. The median nerve passes between the two heads of pronator teres as it enters the forearm. Pronator teres inserts here, halfway down the lateral surface of the radius. Here's its action, pronation. The second pronator muscle is pronator quadratus, 
which arises from the anteromedial aspect of the ulna and inserts here on the anterior surface of the radius. Here's the action of pronator quadratus. Now let's look at the two muscles which produce supination, the one that we have. Now let's look at the two muscles which produce supination. The one that we haven't seen yet is simply called supinator. Here it is. It arises from the lateral epicondyle, from the annular ligament, and from this ridge on the ulna, the supinator crest. It's inserted on the radius along a line ending just above the insertion of pronator teres. The deep branch of the radial nerve runs through the supinator. It enters here and emerges under here. Here's the action of supinator. It's a nice match for pronator teres. The other supinator muscle we know about already. It's the biceps. The insertion of the biceps on the radial tuberosity gives it plenty of power to rotate the radius, especially when the elbow is flexed. When the biceps is working as a supinator, its flexing action is held in check by the simultaneous action of the triceps. Because of the great strength which biceps contributes, supination is a more powerful action than pronation. Now, let's look at the muscles which produce wrist movement. There are three flexors and three extensors. We'll look at the flexors first. The two important ones are flexor carpi radialis and flexor carpi ulnaris. They both arise from the medial epicondyle where they share a massive tendon of origin, the common flexor tendon, with two other flexor muscles. In addition, flexor carpi ulnaris has an extensive ulnar head which arises from this border of the ulna. The ulnar nerve, as we'll see, passes between the to arrive at the radial and ulnar sides of the wrist. Flexor carpi radialis passes through a deep ligamentous tunnel and ends up inserting on the base of the second metacarpal. Flexor carpi ulnaris inserts on the pisiform bone. From the pisiform, the pull of flexor carpi ulnaris is transmitted to the hamate bone and to the base of the fifth metacarpal by these strong ligaments, the pisohamate and pisometacarpal ligaments. The two wrist flexors, acting together, produce flexion of the wrist. Acting separately, the ulnar and radial flexors contribute to ulnar abduction and radial abduction, respectively. Lying between these two main wrist flexors is a third small one, palmaris longus. It arises from the medial epicondyle like the other two. Its tendon, seen here in the intact forearm, lies superficial to all its neighbors and inserts not into bone, but into this dense layer of fascia, the palmar aponeurosis, which covers the palm of the hand. Through this soft tissue insertion, palmaris longus helps to flex the wrist. It's frequently absent. Now let's go around to the other side of the forearm and see the wrist extensors. Here they are, extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis, and extensor carpi ulnaris. Brachial radialis, which you'll remember goes from here to here, has been removed in this dissection. Extensor carpi radialis longus arises from the lateral epicondylar ridge just below brachial radialis. Extensor radialis brevis arises from the lateral epicondyle, an origin which it shares with several other extensor muscles. They all arise together from the epicondyle and from this common extensor tendon. Extensor carpi ulnaris arises from the lateral epicondyle. It also has an ulnar head, which arises from this border of the ulna. As the extensor tendons cross the back of the wrist, they pass under this structure, the extensor retinaculum, which acts as a pulley. 
extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis are inserted on the basis of the second and third metacarpals, extensor ulnaris on the base of the fifth metacarpal. When the wrist extensors act together, they extend the wrist. That's an important part of the action we make when we go to grip something. The powerful gripping muscles whose tendons run over the front of the wrist are slack and feeble when the wrist is flexed, but they become tight and powerful when it's extended. When the radial extensors or the ulnar extensor contract separately, they help to produce radial or ulnar abduction of the wrist. They do this in conjunction with the corresponding wrist flexor muscle, either radial or ulnar. major. Here's the short head of biceps running close to coracobrachialis. Running up behind biceps and coracobrachialis is latissimus dorsi. Here's brachialis going to its insertion on the ulna and here's biceps on its way to the radius. Here's pronator teres crossing over from the medial epicondylar ridge to the radius. Also arising from the medial epicondyle, here are flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus, and flexor carpi ulnaris. Here's pronator quadratus, deep to everything. Now let's go around and take a look at the back. Here's the triceps with its long head going up beneath the deltoid. Here's teres major, and here's latissimus dorsi again. Here's triceps going to its insertion on the olecranon. Here's brachioradialis going to the radius here. Here's extensor carpi radialis longus and brevis and extensor carpi ulnaris. Lying deep to all the muscles which share the common extensor tendon is supinator all on its own. At this point, our picture of the forearm is complete as to some functions, incomplete as to others. That's the way we're going to leave it for now. We'll be returning to the forearm in the next section to look at the important muscles there that we've not seen yet, the long muscles of the fingers and of the thumb.